Biodiversity in Biological Sciences at Simon Fraser University. Um, he's also the chair of the Biodiversity Committee of the Canadian Society for Ecology and Evolution. He's also part of a, a multi-faculty team of researchers um, called the Fab Lab that studies organic evolution. Um, and just, uh, I looked at some of the work that Dr. Morris has done and I've been amazed at the diversity of topics that he's covered. He's covered things from plant pollinator interactions, mammal work, bird work, phylogenetic work, policy work, um, lots of papers in diverse fields that I find fascinating. And one that I want to point out that I find really interesting from my perspective being on COSIWIC is his 2007 paper that talks about biases in legal status listings. And when you look at, there's a really telling table in that paper that tells you about where, when social factors do come into play about deciding on species. So thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me. Now that, I'm going to talk about the value side of the equation that Bridget put out. Just one very small part of it. Um, that's a cutout from 1980, New York Times. So this idea of prioritization has been around for a long time. Um, that's an editorial in Nature in 2007, which also talked about prioritization, and this is they, I'm not sure they use the word triage there, and I don't really, I'm completely comfortable with equating triage with prioritization, just leaving it at that. And I want to get, um, just, I want to discuss a little bit about prioritization itself at the species level. And I think we should have a discussion about what a species is. I'm surprised this hasn't come up. Um, so I'm going to start with a philosophy book by Brian Norton way back in 87. So th this has been going on for a long time, in, at least in the United States, where he uh, organized the kinds of things that we might use and multiply together somehow um, to come up with a value for a bit of biodiversity. I, I want to call it a bit of biodiversity, but I'll probably use the word species. So there are formal uh, criteria. Those are things that are, that are objective and apply to any bit of biodiversity. You don't need to know the name, really. You don't need to know about the individuals. And then there are these things that he calls substantive values, like the ecological value or the aesthetic value. And I made the mistake <clears throat> when I first started thinking about this and saying, well, there should be an equation that you can put all those together and come up with a number. And Norton points out that the formal stuff you probably can do that with, but the substantive stuff you cannot. And so it's a complete fool's errand. Um, but let's just break it down a little bit and look at uh, at least some of those squares. Now, E.O. Wilson, in a book uh, about diversity of life back in 1992, suggested, and I'm, I will be very interested to hear how comfortable, comfortable you are with this suggestion, that one aim, he says the aim of conservation, should be the preservation of the information content contained in the DNA of all the species on the Earth. <coughs> so we've heard about this and the discomfort with this, but I think you can think about this in a slightly different way that may be, may tie this into some of the stuff that Ted was talking about this morning. That was called genetic, dis that is tied, I'm going to say that that idea is tied to genetic distinctness, which is something I call the evolutionary isolation. So that's that upper left box, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on, and asking how that box is connected to, the, to those other boxes. So, in fact, everything is related, we all know that. There's a, a, a lovely picture of, of uh, the tree of life. We can formalize that a little bit more. And this is a, uh, the way that I draw trees. So the bottom is the past, the top is the present. The tips are things that you can recognize as being different species. The branch lengths represent something. And the easiest thing for me to think of them as representing is time. So millions of years, thousands of years. So the closer you are on the tree, the, the more time you share on the tree. That tree, connecting the species, represents shared and unique information concerning solved evolutionary problems, right? We're around because of past adaptation, so we have solved evolutionary problems. This is a shared component, this is the unique component. This is a shared component, this is a unique component. If what we're trying to do is preserve the total information content, then we, if we take a slight leap of logic, perhaps, Wilson says, we should be the tree actually represents Wilson's information content. And if the tree represents information content, 
And the recipe, Wilson's recipe for conservation, the aim or a aim, is actually to preserve as much of the tree as possible. The sum of all those branch lengths in my field is called phylogenetic diversity, or PD. So you're going to see that uh, later in the talk. That's Dan Faith formalized that, again, quite a, quite a while ago. So the sum of all those branch lengths in millions of years, so 30 million years, of PD represents the solved, the time it took to solve all the evolutionary problems leading to those few species. Okay, so I'm going to try to connect the tree to Norton's prioritization. So I'm connecting the tree, which may be the, diff the, the, the diacritic differences that Ted was talking about, to the sedimentation to the tips, because we're talking about prioritizing the tips. So can you connect the tree to the tips? First thing we're going to do, and um, this is just uh, a very short, is to see if phylogenetic diversity actually has some connection to value. And then I'm going to try to map uh, the, the phylogenetic diversity onto the tips, and then I'm going to say that maybe this is ridiculous. <laughs> so um, Ted expressed uh, skepticism in, our, um, in the claim that biodiversity is actually good for something, and he referred to, to uh, David Tillman. This is, da this is David Tillman's um, famous set of fields in Wisconsin, large set of fields, about three by three. Each little square there is about three meters by three meters. Um, a whole long set of experiments where they asked whether more species actually led to more stable plots or uh, more pro productivity on those plots. Um, more resilient to invasive from other species, etc., etc. This man, Mark Cadot, who's from Northern Ontario, he tells me, went back and analyzed all of the, the data that, that had been collected over 20 years on those plots. And I'm actually referring to number two here. So across a set of famous experimental plots, David Tillman's, testing the, in, the, the relationship between biodiversity and different measures of ecosystems functioning, PD, the total numbers of the, the millions of years of phylogenetic history represented by those species in those plots was a better predictor of ecosystem function than species richness was, and functional richness, and the things that you could measure. So it, it, was, a, it was a surrogate, it was a better surrogate uh, of, the, of biodiversity um, than what we usually do, which would be like functional groups or numbers of species. And then he went and looked, looked at our 29 global experiments and found the same thing. And this is, this is just the, how much better it was, it doesn't really matter. And then just recently he published, just this year, he published a small scale experiment where he designed, where it was designed to specifically test whether phylogenetic diversity was um, a particularly good measure of ecosystem function. And this is just uh, one figure, so he took a bunch of plant species, this is all plant work. Um, he built the tree, connected them, so that's just like the tree of, of the great apes that you saw. And then he seeded uh, different plots with species that were either closely related to each other, mediumly related to each other, or distantly related to each other. If you can see here that they have lots of unique history between them. And then he measured phylogenetic diversity on all the different plots, and then he measured the biodiversity effect. And when you're measuring the biodiversity effect here, you're controlling for the species richness, and you're controlling for other aspects, some of these experimental confounds that Ted talked about. And he found that, in fact, there was a strong relationship. So you don't need to buy the biodiversity ecosystem function argument to um, follow along for the rest of the talk, but if you do, it, it would help. <laughs> this suggests that attending to the total evolution, total biodiversity, total phylogenetic diversity, would um, be a prudent thing to do if you're interested in something like some utilitarian thing like ecosystem function. And that's the Noah's Ark approach, right? Noah didn't take, you know, six gorillas and one giraffe. He took two giraffes and two gorillas. He actually took a broad, as broad a range as he could of the total phylogenetic diversity. So, and it's, this is referred to in my literature, in the literature that I read, as the Noah's Ark approach. The fact is, pragmatically, we don't uh, use the Noah's Ark approach. I don't know why we don't, but we don't. What we actually do do is focus on individual species. We focus on individual species for the law, we focus on individual species for the zoos, and we're focusing on individual species in this symposium. So can we map phylogen total phylogenetic diversity 
back onto species. So this is the science part of the talk. So evolutionary isolation, broadly speaking, is just how lonely you are on the tree of life. So these are some examples. So here's a, here are two mammals that uh, both live in fresh water, look pretty much the same. This is North American river otter, one of four species in its genus, Lantra, and it's one of 26 genera made up of 66 species in its family. You can ca contrast that to the Australian platypus, which is the only species in its genus, and that genus is the only genus in its family. So the platypus is more lonely than the North American river otter on the tree of life. That actually can be quantified if you can build a tree. So if you build a tree here where this is the past, this is the present, um, and you have some measure, some genetic distance, which again, I'm, I'm um, not abstracting, but actually considering to be time, millions of years, you have, to, you have to do that translation with genetic data. Then you can say things like, well, C is like your platypus, which is more isolated than, for instance, species A, more unique, less shared history, um, and A, in turn, is more isolated than D is, because A has more unique history than D. Right? D is on the shortest branch. So D shares more of its total evolutionary history, which may or may not be the, the, something of what um, uh, Tim was talking about, with uh, everyone else um, than A does, and C is the most isolated. This actually can be turned into a metric, and it turns out that there is a particularly useful metric, which is to ask, how much do you contribute each tip? How much do you contribute to the tree into the future if you don't know what the tree is going to look like? So if you don't know who's going to go extinct in the future, then you can say, well, let's say everyone sticks around. Well, if everyone sticks around, then D contributes this much. You maybe say that that's one million years. <coughs> you say, okay, that's, you've got that much on, on, on your side of the ledger. But what happens if it, in the future, actually A is the only one left? So if A is the only one left, then you actually contribute all of this. E is gone, so you actually now are responsible for all of this evolution. And if C is gone, you're also responsible for all of, all of this evolution. And so D actually has this much. And if you take the average of all possible scenarios into the future, and you say, well, how much do you contribute on average to all future scenarios? That is a measure of evolutionary isolation. Incredibly quick to, to, um, uh, to actually score on a species, and it turns out it has some really useful property. It has one particularly useful property. So if we go back, and we've done this, so we now have good trees for all of the mammals of the world and all of the birds of the world. So if you go back and um, you do this, you'll find that the North American river otter, which we knew wasn't particularly isolated, its isolation score, using that metric, is about six million years. So it represents about six million years of uh, evolutionary history. And it's ranked 3,392nd most isolated mammal. The Australian platypus, on the other hand, actually has an isolation score of 81 million years. And that makes it the second ranked mammal. One, I should say, one thing, if you add all these scores up across all the tips, that equals the total history of that group. So you're actually mapping the total tree back onto the species. That's one of the, what's one of the useful properties of this metric. What's the number one species? Anyone want to take a guess? Nope, close, it's about four. Okay, we've got pangolin, anteater, it's the aardvark. It's yep, isolation of 88.2 million years. So that's the rank number one mammal. Now I should say that because our tree is not particularly <coughs> precise, there's probably, it's probably a toss up between the Australian platypus uh, and the aardvark. So you have to take this, but they're both particularly um, isolated. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so I'm going to wait. <laughs> Here are some other isolated species, just, just to sort of give you a sense of what's out there. So there's actually, so we haven't seen very many of these, but there's a plant, there's the ginkgo. Um, it has roughly 270 million years of, of history that doesn't share with anything else on the planet. The coelacanth, the lungfish, 
uh, Nautilus and one of my favorites, the, the Tuatara. These haven't been quantified because we don't have good trees for these, good phylogenetic trees for these yet, but these will score very high when we do. My favorite, though, is the coastal tailed frog, just been split into two species, which is why I think we should discuss this. Um, it's, so it's roughly fifth of about 5,726 amphibian species in the world, and lo and behold, we have a fair amount of the global responsibility, Canada does, a fair amount of the global responsibility for that frog. It's a tailed frog. Frogs aren't supposed to have tails. Okay, so we have this metric. We have some, evi we have some evidence that, that maximizing total, the total tree may actually, actually uh, have some ecological value in terms of biodiversity. The question is, can you, can you make a connection between this species level uh, a measure and ecological value via PD? Well, it turns out that if you build a bunch of simulated trees and you say, well, if I let, if I chose the eight, half of them, it could be any number, if I chose the eight, eight most isolated using my species metric, how much of the tree do I get? Versus if I just chose eight species at random. And it turns out that, there, you don't see the error bars on this, but uh, this is highly significant, these error bars are really tiny, that if I choose eight species at random from a tree, I'd get much less of the total tree than if I chose the eight most isolated species. So if I choose the most isolated species, I get more of the total, it didn't have to be that way, but I get more of the total tree than if I chose them at random. And indeed, I get pretty, I get pretty close to the maximum possible. So I use the Noah's Ark approach, that would be the blue, if I use the species approach, I would get red, and if I just did use some other approach, I'd get this. But this is simulated data, and I could, I could tell you anything, right? Because I could simulate anything I want. What about with some real data? Uh, this, so this is the hoopoo, and uh, we built a tree of all 9,993 species of bird uh, just last year. And that tree, so this is the tree, you, can't, you can hardly see it. So this is the tree, sorry, it's a circle. It's, it's, you can't show it as a flat, so you sort of wrap it around itself. So that's the middle, so that's 100, 100, 100 million years ago, and this is now, and those are the major groups. And if you add up all those branches, the total PD is about 77 billion years, right? So all the tree, all the uh, birds on the planet, all the species, um, represent collectively 77 billion years of evolution. On that, we can map how isolated they are. So the, the colors now, the warmer the colors, the more isolated. You can see that because the longer branches, like the platypus, um, are on these long, are red, dark colors, and the short branches are these cold colors. So the colder colors are, are not particularly isolated. So most, you know, a songbird is a songbird is a songbird, little brown jobs, I think they're called, those guys uh, tend to be on short branches, closely related to each other, not isolated, whereas some of these other species um, um, are quite isolated. And then what we've done around the, the, the outside circle here, um, these are all the species that are at risk. And uh, I think Bridget said something like 8%. We have 575 species that the IUCN considers to be at risk, um, each either critically endangered um, or threatened. And then you can see they're pretty well distributed all around the tree. So global risk. What if we used isolation to choose which species we were going to prioritize first, right? So we, we instead of taking the eight, we say, okay, we're going to take the most isolated species that, that's at risk, and then we're going to take the second most isolated species that is at risk, and the third. So we prioritized, we went to the government, we said, we want to focus on this species first, and then you can work on this one, and this one, and this one. How much of the tree would you get? Okay, so this is the important graph, the only graph. This is the important graph. These, this goes from zero to 575 species. So you start with one and you end up with all of them. And this is how much extra history, extra PD, extra evolution you save as you start preserving or conserving species. If you did it randomly, this is the line. So these all, this, the, all these squiggles, all these different lines refer to different trees. We have got um, an infinite number of trees. And so we draw trees and we ask, okay, if, if this is the right tree, what do we get? If this is the right tree, what do we get? 
Um, as I say, there's, there's slop in how good our trees are. But if you chose species randomly from that pool of 575, you get pretty much a straight line in terms of how much extra tree you get. Um, if you choose using isolation, you get the red line. And that red line is almost indistinguishable from if we use the Noah's Ark approach. I haven't got it published yet. Um, I, so to me, this mapping, this, so this is, did not have to be the case, right? So this, is, this, this uh, uh, was actually a surprise. But what we're finding empirically, not just from simulations, but empirically, we can use a species value to capture something that may, uh, uh, a measure of difference that may also have a biodiversity functional component or utility. I'm quite excited about that particular result. That's an, uh, that's an empirical result. We did the same thing for mammals. I don't have a, uh, as good a picture, but we get the same result on the mammal tree. So if the mammal tree and the bird tree may be uh, anonymo uh, anomalous um, with respect to this pattern, but we don't think so. Which suggests that there is some connection potentially between a mapping evolution isolation. Because of the relationship between evolution and isolation and phylogenetic diversity, there may be a mapping from isolation ecological value. We can also do this, which I got really excited about when I first did it. I said, well, isn't it cool that we could actually multiply isolation, which is a score in terms of millions of years. So you, this species is, has a score of 10 million years. We can actually multiply it by the probability of it going extinct. And that's just like a lottery ticket, right? What's your expected winning? Well, how much you're going to win and what's your probability of winning? That's how you calculate whether you're going to buy a ticket or not, right? I say, well, if, if, if there are too many people playing, then my expected return is less than the cost of the ticket. I'm not going to play. Well, this is an expected loss. This is how many millions of years do you expect to lose for each and every species. So it's, in fact, a compound measure of value that is quantifiable and formal under the Norton uh, uh, rubric. And that's called expected loss. Unfortunately, probably the extinction is completely fictional. So we, we, don't, we can't actually ascribe a number to it, but if we could, this would be really cool. People have done this. So the Zoological Society of London took this idea and create, have created the Evolutionary Distinct and Globally Endangered Program. And so they collect lots and lots of money to fund conservation for species that are both isolated on the tree of life and at high risk of extinction. And they actually multiply those two things together. So there is a program that actually does this. Um, okay. So I've made this connection here. I've said that you, 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 you can produce a compound metric and I just put that out there. I, I no longer think, believe that it's a good idea, but people are doing it. Um, and then another thing is we, we can ask a very particular question and a very, maybe perhaps strange question, is, is there a connection between evolutionary isolation and socioeconomic or aesthetic value, this, this fourth box and a substantive uh, measure of value? And that's when I said I was going to get ahead of myself. Isn't the aardvark cool? Isn't the platypus cool? Isn't the tailed frog wacky? Is there a relationship between how isolated you are on the tree of life and how cool you are. And that's actually a serious question that we don't have an answer for because I don't know how to measure coolness, but I hope that somebody might be able to do that. So does evolutionary isolation predict aesthetic value? What is your favorite love to hate mammal? We've been talking about it for three days. What mammal have we been deriding the most, besides humans, what mammal have we been deriding the most this past two days? Fiftieth most isolated mammal on the planet, right? It's a herbivorous bear. It's actually pretty cool ecologically. Whether we should invest as much as we do is a different question. Which of those species, oh, sorry, three of these things are kind of the same. Which of these species is not an evolutionarily isolated species? 
The only one, the only one of these that isn't evolutionary isolated, which is why I said it could become a brown bear, no problem, is the polar bear. These other three are actually quite isolated. Turns out that the the, the uh, beaver. There are only two species of beaver, one in Europe, and they're both in the northern hemisphere. One here and and one in Asia. Those two species individually are extremely isolated, and if you put those two together, they go back 62 million years before they hook into the rest of the tree. They're also ecologically remarkable, right, as being engineers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, one of my favorites, Gulo Gulo, the wolverine, also very isolated, both globally and in Canada. And that's a scale issue that I hope well, somebody will bring up. The orca's the same. So there is some, I can, I, I can come up with examples of species that are both interesting, that we might love, and that are uh, isolated. But whether this is a general phenomenon or not, I don't know. Evolution is divergent. At the limit, it must be true, because evolution is divergent. So things that have no close relatives will be different from other things, and things that have, things that have many close relatives will look like other things. But whether, it's, uh, it, whether that maps onto our cognition, or our preferences, I don't know. Um, and the, the I'm not going to say anything, I wish I could, but I'm not going to say anything about this. When I read Norton's, um, the, uh, when I looked at the way that Norton had set this up, I was surprised that he had separated ecological val value from socioeconomic value, because we're now trying to monetize ecosystem services and give them monetary value. So I think that those things are actually the same to me. Um, obviously, there's, there's take and things involved in there, but I think that there's probably more connection here than... Um, he might have thought back in 1987. And so we've got connections between isolation and ecological value. We have connections between ecological value potentially and aesthetic value. We may, I should have a question mark here, we may have connections between isolation and socioeconomic aesthetic value, and we actually have a way to combine these two um, formal values. It gets even potentially more interesting because if we go back to the tailed frog, um, it turns out that the coastal tailed frog I said it was the fifth most distinctive species. Well, all its close relatives, which are also very distinctive, are all in New Zealand, and all but, they're all listed, and two of them are listed as critically endangered. So we have a species in Canada whose relatives are um, at risk of extinction. Now remember I said that my isolation metric um, can can, uh, can, uh, asked, well, how much do you contribute to all possible futures but if we know, if we can make guesses about the possible futures, and those possible futures don't include, or are likely not to include, those close relatives, then the isolation of this species goes way up. <coughs> and so in some real sense, one of the species that we steward in Canada bears genetic responsibility for its close relatives that are, da that are greater danger. And you can quantify that. If you believe in these fictitious probabilities of extinction, then you can quantify that as well. So we have different ways of combining some of these um, values. So, evolution isolation captures phylogenetic diversity. Uh, it may be a surrogate for some of the other values. Uh, it can be formally combined with risk. It can be formally combined with the risk of relatives. And it's scalable, and I think this is quite important. It's scalable um, geographically, so you can simply consider the species in Canada build a tree of just those species and say, well, what's the most isolated species in Canada? So for instance, the most isolated mammal in Canada globally is something uh, called the mountain beaver, which probably none of you have seen because it's quite hard to see. Um, but if we just looked at the species in Canada and we forgot about relatives elsewhere, which is the way the Endangered Species Act works, then the most isolated species, the mammal is in fact the Virginia possum, right? Because it's our only marsupial. And the second most isolated species, what's the second most isolated mammal in Canada? <coughs> the human, right? Because we're the only primate. So the, depending on the scale that you look at, you can get different, well, you said human before, right? The, 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 depending on the scale that you look at, you can come up with different answers, but that's actually maybe a benefit to this um, approach. Um, it's also scalable down to the population as well as up to the species. So you don't have to worry about what a species is, which is why I asked this question about designatable units, right? Anything that, that you can get a genetic distance from, you can use this sort of uh, approach. So 
it's possible that this uh, uh, sort of thing may take us some way down the line to filling in this value uh, um, portion of the of the equation that we were shown. And this is the this is the paper that uh, Bridget referred to, where we talked about conservation triage. This is another triage paper, conservation prioritization paper about caribou. Here's one from just um, last year, time to accept conservation triage uh, in birds. And this suggests that maybe this is a reasonable stance for us to take. That maybe we are tasked with providing some of these values. Now, this isn't the only value that goes into the matrix, but we can maybe uh, um, offer some values that might be considered. So I don't think this should be us particularly, but there may be an argument that somebody or some group of people may have to do this. However, I don't think that is the case. So the question here is, is there, recognized, is there some reason why we should be prioritizing species at all? And I don't mean because we have to, because uh, we only have so much money or whatever. I mean, why are we doing it? And here I just wrote it out because I want to make sure everybody understood what I was saying. Species are more or less distinct lineages in the tree of life, and the more interesting among them may have utility on their own, aesthetic utility, ecological utility. Their thriving in the landscape may indicate the integrity of that landscape, and therefore their sound management may then lead to sound landscape management. And we've heard that again and again and again. Well, if you protect a species, you have to protect its habitat, so it's a good way to protect habitat. But it is puzzling to me, and has been for quite a while, why indicators were given such a central place in a dialogue about managing our affairs. And as Norton points out, and others have pointed out, and we heard this morning almost the same sort of words, nature isn't a warehouse, and so I don't know why we treat it like a warehouse and look at the units and shelve them and put them in their place. Thank you very much. I hope we have time for discussion. Uh, thanks, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, I'm a fan of PDs, as, as I think you know. Um, you'll be aware, of course, there are lots of different measures that we can use to detect uh, distinctness in an evolutionary sense. So there are different ways of measuring phylogenetic distinctness, taxic distinctness. Um, it, you choose one... Sorry, wait, wait, to, just to clarify. There are many ways, there are many uh, metrics or there are many inputs? There are many ways of... Many metrics. Well, so, the, so for the same tree, there are many ways of calculating the, the isolation of a, of a particular tip. Well, so you treat branch lengths as proportional to time. Some people treat them as proportional to feature diversity. Some people don't use branch lengths. They just have trees where they only treat the nodes as being important. So there's different ways you can cut the cake. And, and I think for somebody who treats time as the metric, I, I like it. I think it's a very sensible thing to do. But I take it that the, the normal question people ask you is what do you say about rates and modes of evolution? So rates of evolution change over time, so one branch length for you is not always going to be really commensurable with, with other branch lengths. So that and a quick comment. And the quick comment is that I thought you did fantastic salesmanship of, of selling this idea that uh, phylogenetic uh, isolation brings up really cool species. But again, I thought we were stuck in the land of the mammals and the land of the birds, and we got to amphibians, but if we were really going to do this, you should have been velvet worms or something. And that's the real test, because there are going to be lots of things in, in your way of doing it, it's my way of doing it too, but that have you know, a lot of evolutionary isolation that, that uh, are just things that the ordinary populace don't know anything about, would be interested in at all. So, yeah, so, um, so the two parts to that, one is, why I stuck with good-looking things to begin with, and that's partly because those are the only things for which we have good genetic data. Um, but it does bring up the idea, the issue of scale. So when you compare how isolated something is, you're still comparing it back to some group. How isolated is it compared to all the other birds, all the other mammals, all the other amphibians? And the question is, how far can we go out to do the comparison? As and then whether it works for other groups independent of that comparison of other comparative group. Point taken, this this open way to do it and find out, right? Um, the other more uh, interesting, I think, less empirical, well also empirical, is is time the right metric 
for estimating uh, isolation. And I think that really is, still is an empirical question. It's fungible, because you can, you, can you can run it across any group. Um, it makes sense because it makes sense metaphorically or because you can talk about heritage, history, all the, all the language is there. Whether time is, a, is, is the best predictor of feature diversity, actual difference, um, I think is an empirical question. It must be in the limit. Um, disregarding time, disregarding branch lengths completely makes uh, no theoretical sense. And that's a historical thing, historical point, because we didn't have those branch lengths before. But whether there's some transformation that should be done uh, is what we're working on now. I think that's where we're going, yeah. Thanks, and um, very fascinating. I just um, a couple questions. Uh, is it if you if this is a new metric and this is one that you think would, would carry a lot of power, and it sounds it sounds like it would. Um, but I see though from a philosophy or uh, sort of humanist side, um, new metrics like you know if an animal is slow in speciation, if it's a living fossil, if, <coughs> if its speciation hasn't really changed much in a long time, then this becomes a new value system. Um, or its genes have been tested for over a long time. Sometimes I've heard that language. That now becomes sort of long-tested genes, whatever that means. Um, and um, I wonder, you know, then we're almost penalizing animals that go extinct faster or something like that versus slower extinction rates or something like that. You, you see, you know, in other words, there's a penalization. For, if, it, if an animal speciates faster, it gets penalized. Exactly, in yes. this model. And yes. So what do you do with that now? So the question, and this is a common, this is a common, um, question or thought is that we are um, focusing in this exercise on species that have no close relatives and therefore all the relatives have gone extinct or they haven't been particularly good at diversifying themselves and, and we are ignoring those lineages that are good at good that, in, uh, that for some reason have lots of close relatives and um, that is in fact absolutely true and there are two ways to deal with the discomfort that, that that causes some people. The first is that we're, if you've got close relatives, then you are in fact looked after because they're not all gonna go extinct. And some of them will survive. Right? So that's built into the situation. And the other is that we can't predict the future. And the idea that we should be betting on winners because they're good speciators, um, because the time scales are wrong, because speciation occurs over a much longer time scale than, than uh, anthropogenic extinction, then there's no way we can bet on, we can bet on winners. So those are the two thoughts that usually help people situate. You still may not agree with it, but the, that helps situate that worry. Justina? Um, I was one, I, I was somebody that was uh, grappling with scale issues mm -hmm. right from the beginning of your talk, and you did, you did address that to, to the most extent towards the end. You were awfully democratic in your presentation with respect to sort of the global picture of where evolutionary distinct species that are, for example, have been analyzed by EDGE, the New Zoological Society of London. And in fact, there is a, a large proportion of the most distinct species are not in the Northern Hemisphere, where probably glaciation is, and other forces have made less opportunity, less time and space for that kind of evolutionary distance to occur. And where that gets I was wondering what your thoughts are about sort of then where the values do get enter into that. I mean, evolutionary distinctiveness has been brought forward as, as one reason, and this is where politics come into play, for prioritizing species uh, that get recovery strategies, for example, in Canada, at the scale of Canada. And so I was wondering if you could give some advice in terms of how you, how you can maintain uh, some of the terrific thoughts and provoking and interesting concepts, but without without having that turn into a system where really very few species actually get um, held up as important in a Canadian context, because they really just at a global scale, and when push comes to shove compared to the platypus and all these other guys, they're just not that evolutionary distinct. Notwithstanding some of your great examples. So the, um, so no, I, don't, I think the answer, easy answer is I don't, know that I can, um, ex except to, except 
but I could, but I can say that uh, there's nothing. Given that our legislation refers to the species within our borders, if we if we buy that, and we don't use global responsibility as one of the criteria or, or a driving criterion, then you just say, well, what are the most distinctive species of those that are in our for over which we have uh, stewardship? So you just move the scale down, and you can do that at any scale. You can do it. You can do it at the scale of of the plot. I mean, the BE stuff is actually the ecosystem function of biodiversity, or the phylogen phylogenetic uh, diversity ecosystem function is done actually at the plot level. So this can work at any scale. Um, the more distinctive you are globally, the more likely you are to be you you are to be distinctive or isolated um, at smaller scales. But you can actually measure it at the smaller scales. Um, I grapple with this idea of, of how a nation how a nation state approaches conservation, given that it shares its biodiversity with other nation states. I think that's a that's a bigger question. I think. I wanted to. Uh, I got a comment and a question. The first thing is that I want to thank you for a great talk. I was I grabbed my comment form here where I had put I was moderately enjoyed the integration of the humanities and the sciences, but then wrote what are the highlights. Absolutely, the link between uh, Arnie's talk and Ted's talk. <laughs> the combination of the talks with Ernest Six on question one above. <laughs> um, I, I, for, I, I just thought it was really good the nimbleness with which you kind of built in what you heard this morning into your, into your uh, very much otherwise science y talk, and that was good. The question is. Um, from an evolu uh, you know, we had for a long time this concept of evolutionary significant units, which was, I thought, was also supposed to capture something about the memory <laughs> and, the, and the history and everything, and this was the idea. Was it the problem with the metrics? I mean, the thing I, it always came down to me was the very first paper, one of the big papers that came out at the time was, well, you know, there's the, the turtles in the Atlantic and the turtles in the Pacific to evolutionary significant units, and I still thought, okay, well, what's the decision maker going to do with that? I mean, are they really going to say, oh, don't worry about the Atlantic one, because all that evolutionary history is over here on the Pacific anyway? Um, I wonder if, I, first of all, is that a fair criticism of that <laughs> concept, right? And then second, does this get us around that when it comes to prioritizing the tips? That's what I... I think it does, but I'm not quite sure how. Right. So, the, tech, the, answer, the technical answer to the first part is that evolutionary significant units um, tried to identify the tips but never ranked them. They tried to identify the tips. The problem with that is they tried to identify them using a tree when actually you need a network. That's the technical answer. Okay. Does this get around um, the? Does this? How does this speak to how you deal with diversity on the landscape? like evolutionary significant units, like DUs, and the answer is that this can be applied in exactly the same way, because you can now rank the populations by their expected contribution to the total future genetic variation of the larger unit, which is what this is. This is just the expected contribution of genes to the future. So you can do exactly the same thing on a network. So a decision maker, so the pro somebody's trying to prioritize these things, yep. and they've got one with a long PD and one with a short PD. That's right. But the short PD has a political constituency, and the long PD is a political constituency. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> okay, thanks. I have the answer. Right yeah. How do we still? I, I mean, this is not a criticism of what you've done here or anything. I mean, I really get the intellectual power of what you've contributed or anybody. Yeah, at the end of the day, it doesn't day, actually solve the problem. Yeah, I mean, is it is it it's true. because it has a short, it's a short branch on a tree? Does that mean it's expend, it's, it's expendable in some? Sense. So in this framework, the answer is yes because it's it is redundant. Yes. Yes. Right. Gotcha. Thank you. One last quick question from Stuart, and then we have to go to break, and we can continue discussion over coffee. I, I loved your talk too. Um, uh, sarcastically, sarcastically, until you showed the paper by Hugh Possingham. Um, and so I have a comment and a question. The comment is that I urge you uh, to go to Skeptically Speaking, which is a CBC program. Episode 219 is called Kingdom of Rarities. You can get it by Goodwin, Pym, Possingham, and Triage. 
and I wouldn't be giving you that a recommendation if I didn't think that I'd beaten the hell out of you. Um, my second comment, uh, my question really, is um, that I love what you've done, and, and you've done an extraordinary job of connecting the different pieces, which nobody has done before. I think it's a unique contribution. There's a but coming. And the but is, I don't think we do conservation this way. We do conservation in terms of protecting places. And as soon as you have places, you, yeah, yeah, exactly. You have, you, have a lot of, you have a lot of species involved. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, you know, I love the Tuataras and they're, and they're really special. And the New Zealanders are looking after them. Um, you know, perhaps they should be doing a better job, but it's a, it's a, the Tuatara is not a species, it's not a deeply, uh, a deeply rooted taxon, it's a place. Um, and so whatever we do with this, we have to think of, of how this changes our management of allocation priorities to place. And that's where the, um, you know, the tie hits the road. So can I just say that we have actually <coughs> um, combined this metric with endemism and also mapped it to see how well uh, the sum of these metrics uh, maps onto and is congruent with things like species richest hotspots and to also identify the parts of the world where there's a mismatch between the species richness hotspots and the total PD richness um, and the concentration of the tree. So to try to get a space-based picture of, of all this. Um, but I take your point that this is space-based and the place space and the fact that there's four endangered species in New Zealand and we've got the, the tailed frog here doesn't help the New Zealanders one way. And I meant to say that because I thought that, were, that that's probably a relevant thing to say. So, yeah. This is just someone who's got a hammer and sees a nail everywhere, right? That's his name. All right. Let's thank Bridget and Ernie for really